Anyone here interested in making money using what they know? Yes, starting a business. That was a chuckle, like, hell yeah, of course. Of course I do. That was the, I, of course I do laugh. I love it. Great. So that's a part of what you are going to learn from our next two speakers. Uh, they've come to us today from the Linux Professional Institute, which is focused on individual skills credential. And today you're going to learn a little bit about how to use free and open source software, essentially using the skills that you've amassed and learned to begin to create businesses from those things. Does that sound good to you all? Sound good? OK, woo, I love when I get woos. This is good. So please join me in welcoming to the stage. We've got Matthew Rice and Medina Dupuy. Yeah. Oh, are we? OK. Hi. Well, it is intimate, isn't it? OK. Well, welcome. Um, as our int uh, introduction indicated, we work for Linux Professional Institute, which is a Canadian nonprofit. Let's just see if we can get our. OK. So we're sort of a last minute stand in. Originally, this, this work was to be presented by our chairman of the board. We're a nonprofit, so he's uh, on our board of directors. And uh, he fell ill at the last minute. Um, John Mad Dog Hall has been presenting at Campus Party, I think, almost since inception. Uh, so he was very upset not to be allowed to fly um, and asked us to step in and present his material. So that's what we've done here. Uh, to my right here is um, Matt Rice. He's our executive director. Um, I'm on the business side. I'm the chief business officer for LPI. And as I said, I am not Mad Dog Hall. <laughs> there is a picture of our illustrious leader. Um, and uh, we hope we do an adequate job of this. So here we go. Uh, so up above here, I'm just going to give you a couple of stats about LPI. Uh, LPI is a Canadian-based nonprofit that certifies people in Linux. Uh, we started in 99, so we just celebrated just over 15 years in the industry, which makes us one of the oldest certifying bodies. We have 131,000 certified Linux professionals in our mix, and we just delivered our, uh, just over our 500,000 exams worldwide. Um, we're very proud of the fact that we're in about 180 countries, and we deliver in nine languages. So the main point or introduction, thank you, <laughs> uh, for the uh, piece here is all about how you can use FOSS to further your career. So a lot of people are familiar with how to work in IT and how to, um, what skill sets you need to acquire, but a lot of people don't know, especially going into the future, that in order to do well in the future, you need to acquire a skill set that crosses all platforms, and that's sort of We'll, we'll get into some of the theory behind that a little bit later. Um, but it's extremely important to be flexible. Um, uh, so LPI supports this kind of uh, education, the kinds of things that are going on here at Campus Party, because it really believes in preparing the future, the youth, uh, for the future that's coming and giving them the skill set they need to succeed. In a lot of parts of the world, uh, you'll see that youth unemployment is hitting just unbelievable percentages. And we're trying to do a little our part in improving that situation. Uh, we are very globally distributed, as I mentioned in the first slide. And, um, and that is part of the equation as your youth is not to think about just in what's good in your country, but what's good all over the world. OK, so the theory behind it, uh, open source momentum. Uh, there's a very smart man that just recently published um, an article, uh, Carl Schwab, over at the World Economic Forum. And he's talking a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. So we've had three industrial revolutions that have preceded this age. Uh, the first one was all about mechanical improvements and steam, water, electricity. The second was all around the division of labor and mass production. The third one, uh, which we've been enjoying for the past few decades, is uh, automation, electronics, and IT. But we're entering our fourth. 
And the fourth is the integration of electronics into our physical environment, in everything we have around us, our phones, our guidance systems, our home securities, everything we do is networked and part of IT systems. And that's changing the way we work and the skill sets we're expected to have in the future. Um, I'll just quote here. Um, you can read it on the side behind me. Uh, so the speed of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent. When compared with previous industrial revolutions, the fourth is evolving and at exponential rather than at a linear pace. Moreover, it's disrupting almost every industry in every country, and the breadth and depth of these changes herald the transformation of entire systems of production, management, and governance. That's a pretty chilling statement. <laughs> That's huge. Um, he goes on to talk a little bit about examples of this. So we're getting into things like 3D printing, nanotechnology, uh, material science, energy storage, quantum computing. These are all the kinds of things that are changing everything about the way we relate to each other and the things that we do in our work. Okay, and at this point... Oh, yeah, this here's my... So uh, just a quick uh, show of hands, if, how many of you are interested in a career or to start a business that requires use of technology? All right. And hands up still if you are aware of Linux and open source? All right. Good. Um, well, in that case, we have something to talk about. Um, when you're deciding what you do in your business or in a career, um, there was a study that was done that was asking people to pick from this criteria and a few others um, what was most important to them in picking a career. Um, so as a quick show of hands, the number one, working on an interesting project. All right. Um, money and perks. All right. Um, working with cutting edge technology. All right. Being part of a community. I don't know if any of you were here for the talk just previous, but it was all about communities and how to serve them. Um, all right. And being able to work remotely, flexible hours, being kind of cowboyish, contracts, being pretty employable if that's your stick. No. <laughs> all right. Well, I noticed that probably the second highest number was the picking the uh, interesting projects. Number one was flexibility, no surprise. Uh, life is a little busy. Oh, no, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> so as far as interesting projects go, there's a number of companies or things you can do with technology, especially Linux and open source. Um, companies like DreamWorks uses it, thousands, tens of thousands of computers to do the rendering for their animations. You want me to take that? I'll just, yep. yeah. The, uh, oh, and we're cheating on the slides be on, with cue cards because uh, the, we were a last minute substitution, so we just finished putting the presentation together. <laughs> the, uh, the Mars rover, which has been running around Mars for a few years now, is all built on top of Linux and open source. <laughs> the British Intelligence Service, their computers are all running Linux and open source. Yeah. Doesn't make you a spy if you work there, though. <laughs> Embedded devices, GPSs, smartwatches now, um, pretty much anything that's this size or bigger probably has a computer in it of some sort at this point. And they're getting more and more powerful what you can do with them. And this is uh, the Internet of Things is getting there. More and more devices will be connected, sharing their data, and doing interesting things, and watching you. Entire cities are switching to Linux and open source. Uh, Germany's one of them. The city of Largo in uh, Florida was a pretty famous case study. They were able to cut their IT budget in half just by switching over to open source technology. And they were a lot happier. And just locally, the Dutch police, 
They use Linux and open source as well. And stock exchanges. Not just New York Stock Exchange, there's quite a few, and more and more are switching their infrastructure over to open source technologies. And pretty much any leading tech company you can think of, Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, they're all built on top of open source technology. And of course, even uh, if you know much about the spirit of open source, one of the best perks of open source over closed source solutions is you get the source code. And you do become part of a community just by virtue of downloading the software and using it. If you make any improvements, you're able to share them back. And other people are doing that at the same time. And collectively, you get a much better, more robust, and feature-rich products with open source collaboration than you would get trying to hire a team of developers. Okay? So including that in some industries, such as the automotive industry, companies will even band together to create some of this technology, which they'll share, because that's not really their differentiator. Right? So a lot of embedded systems in cars, uh, the uh, OBD2 stuff, that's all becoming open source technology. Uh, large retailers are using it. CERN, the particle collider uh, over in Switzerland, they use it for all of their computers, desktop and servers. Uh, and even the PS4 was built on top of the Linux operating system. Borrowed heavily. So um, if you were looking for an IT position uh, or starting a business, what do you think of the uh, ability to find interesting work using the technology? Hands up if you think it's possible. All right. Oh, over to you. So the next uh, interesting bit of information that we're going to present is based on a survey that was done recently. Um, mm -hmm. This one's coming from a quotation in the CIO periodical and is talking about the open source job market. Uh, so you can see here this statistic is kind of really interesting if you're looking to position yourself well for the future. 59%, almost 60, are increasing open source hiring. But 87% of IT hiring managers are saying it's hard to find those people. Uh, if you compare the kinds of skills that open source professionals in jobs to uh, what hiring managers think are important, you start to see some overlap there. Um, the number one focus is definitely in, in cloud technologies like OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. Um, and that's, that's carried across both sectors with the second one coming in with security. So when you survey people that are working in the fields, you start to see that their answer to those questions uh, was definitely that they valued working on interesting projects. And that was the number one reason why people were going to jobs. They were looking for jobs that were going to provide them growth. Um, the second and third are all about working with cutting edge technology. So they love what they do, and they want to work on interesting projects that have leading edge. And then the third was also very closely tied there, and that was working globally. It's really, really important to think beyond your own country and think globally. Uh, so the next survey question was all about how do they stay current in their jobs. So as everyone knows, working in IT is it's a constant uh, process of staying up to date and current with what's happening. Things are changing rapidly. Um, and so they asked the question, how do you keep on top of things? And the number one way of doing that for them was to read books, online resources, and free tutorials. And that was kind of a big jump from the next result, which was online training courses. So it was formalized training. And that sort of matches over to a lot of things you'll read, which talk about um, that, that education in general is becoming more informal. Um, certainly professional development, that's true. So they're not going and registering for a course and going to a traditional classroom. They're looking for sources on the internet. 
Um, so our position is that this kind of skill set really does provide access to the kinds of things people are in IT are looking for. It allows you to pick and choose among the kinds of jobs that are out there and be in demand, which allows you to get your top pick of jobs. So it's having that life-work balance, the flexibility of schedule, um, perhaps having your own business where you can freelance or do contracts. Uh, it allows you to work anywhere and telecommute in. Um, working on different time schedules across the globe. Certainly I know uh, we spend our time with a very spread out day where we intersperse personal stuff because we start at six in the morning working in Europe, we're from Canada, and ending the day late because we're talking to the partner in Japan. And that's the reality of telecommuting globally. Uh, one little pitch for our certification is, is uh, distribution neutral, so we believe it prepares people the best. It's not just working on a Red Hat server, it's working on a Debian server or whatever else you're faced with. Um, it's, it tries to stay as distribution neutral as possible. So just coming back to the, uh, the work that was produced by Carl Schwab, um, it, where he's talking about what is this fourth revolution and how do you respond to it. And he says, a world of customer experiences, database service, and asset performance through analytics require new forms of collaboration, particularly given the speed at which innovation and disruption are taking place. Emergence of global platforms and other new business models finally means talent, culture, and organizational forms will have to be rethought. Okay, so I get the um, privilege of handling and pitching some questions that uh, John Hall wanted us to make sure we covered in our presentation. Um, what I didn't cover in the beginning was that for, I think, the last seven years, 10 years, oh. uh, Matt Rice has also worked on product development, which for us means working closely with technical experts all around the globe and producing the exam objectives by which we test people's skill set. So he knows an awful lot, and he is the best person to answer these questions. Um, he began his work in open source in 1994, which was even before LPI was created. Um, and he has done a lot of independent work uh, for many large companies. Um, his degree is actually in engineering, and um, he's been programming since the 80s. So with that, I will just grab my little cheat sheet. And can you give us a little bit more detail around how you got started in open source? Ah, OK. So my first job out of university was uh, programming in a Unix environment. And Unix is the operating system upon which Linux was emulated or copied, at least in how it works in principle, um, which was what made the segue into Linux fairly easy. Uh, in fact, it was, the transition was even easier because on Unix, it turned out uh, people were starting to write a lot of this free software, which was available on Unix. So we started replacing tools and pieces of the operating system with open source technology uh, piece by piece. And then eventually, I needed a computer for working at home. And Unix didn't really run on it. So I heard about Linux, which was getting p fairly popular, relatively speaking, uh, back in the, I guess, mid-90s. And, uh, and I installed it on my computer at home, and it worked better than the Unix operating systems. And it wasn't even at a 1.0 version. So. Uh, can you just explain to everybody, um, a lot of people talk about open source, but what exactly is the difference between open and closed source systems? All right. So open source software is software that you can get with the source code. Uh, it also comes with a, a license, which tells you what you can do with that source code. Now, generally, with open source software, that license means you can take the software, modify it, um, resell it, um, as long as you give the source code to that software that you created and give to, gave to somebody or sold to somebody. Uh, you have to give them the source code for it as well. Um, now, that said, there's still a lot of ways to make money just on pure open source uh, software technology. You can help people use it. It's just like any software. Uh, you can't learn everything. And if you want to build an entire company's infrastructure on it, you're definitely going to need some help. 
And so there's a lot of companies from the size of IBM down to one or two man shops that help people set up this infrastructure, manage it, create custom applications, uh, modify existing ones if they want to, um, and then of course even just services around educating the users on how to use what's being put in place, um, and of course maintaining it long term. So. Okay, and if you were to pick the top things you'd recommend um, for a student who just wants to get started, what would it be? Well, the use of open source technology falls into a few main areas. One is uh, using existing software to create, say, business or uh, educational solutions or whatever industry you happen to be serving. Uh, then there's also, that's typically called administration or system administration. Um, taking an application, even one that's built internally by a de software development team, and deploying that and maintaining that for the company as well. That's pretty much administration. Sometimes they call it the word DevOps, if anyone's heard it. Hands up if you've heard the term DevOps. All right. Then there's the other side, which is actually creating new software, new programs. Right? So that's where you get into languages like Java, uh, PHP, C, C++, C Sharp on Windows. Um, that's another area you can go into. And then there's sort of niches on those both sides. Um, so probably I would start with a bit of uh, research and maybe a class on each of those main areas and see if you, you know, which side appeals to you. Right? Um, the other option is if you're going to be using this for your own business um, and it's a technology product, um, at that point you'll also have to do some design research figure out what you actually have to know to do that specific thing, and, and that'll dictate what you have to learn first. OK, and um, the last question that I have, and then I'm going to open it up to any questions that anybody has, um, is how do uh, young people demonstrate their knowledge base and the things they've learned in Linux mm. and open source? And um, you know, do they need to get certified? Right. So being certified is not a necessity, although if you're looking for employment, you'll quite often find that it helps uh, through the interview and filtering process of getting hired, um, and also helps uh, you stand out. Uh, and it's also an easy way for a third party to verify that you do at least have some base knowledge of what you're trying to do f that they're hiring for. Uh, of course, it's never a complete part of that process. Uh, of course, the interview process, maybe some internship uh, interviews with key staff that would know that technology as well. That would all be part of the interview process. Um, but the, the certification does give an employer uh, the expectation that the interview process will go well and that you do have that foundational knowledge that they're expecting you to have for that job. The other thing I should point out is our certifications are Although they're fairly general in the knowledge we expect, they're very useful for a broad category of IT uh, careers. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah. Oh, sorry, no, there was one other point I wanted to make. The other thing is, in the open source communities, because you do have access not only to the source code, but to the other developers of the technology, uh, another way to stand out is to actually participate in those projects. So find some of the software that you like or that you're thinking of using for solutions that you want to provide and start participating in that community, maybe helping with some bug fixes, documentation, anything to get started. And you'll find that, well, if you start helping them, they'll start coming back for more. And you'll also find ways to help them. So. Great. OK, um, at this point, does anybody have any questions on any of the topics that we've delivered here? Um, any questions about how to get started or? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what kind of certification do you have? Is there only one or do you have different for different products? Uh, we broke it up into a number of levels of expertise and then at the top end divided into concentration or specialist areas. So at the very lowest level is what we call Linux Essentials, which is just um, any knowledge worker that's going to have to touch a Linux machine for pretty much even just daily use um, for, as a desktop or to log in and do some fundamental um, or, and critical maintenance work, like really simple things, um, that's what that lowest level is. 
that the next level is basically the uh, Linux system administrator level, which uh, shows that you know how the entire operating system works and shows that you have the basis to basically start learning any specific job role, whether that's you know, a DevOps role, a database administrator, developer, um, network administrator, um, even cloud technology, things like that. Uh, the second level does get into building entire business infrastructure using Linux and Linux software or open source software. And then the third levels get into security and uh, virtualization, high availability, and fairly, I wouldn't say niche areas, but very specialized areas. So that said, we are actually just doing a uh, survey. If anyone wants the URL, let me know. Um, we're planning on broadening the offering of credentials that we do uh, in open technologies. Uh, so if, if there's certain ones you think would be uh, generally useful um, you know, uh, and fairly commonly required, uh, that's what we're targeting. Because you know, we're trying to target certifications for where the most jobs are to help people get those positions. Um, hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So if I wanted to get certified using one of your certifi certifications, how would I uh, get started? Sorry, could you say that again? If I wanted to get certified using your certification, yeah. how would I get started? Ah, well, you, you go to our website, zlpi.org, and it has a list of the different certifications and very long description of everything we expect you to know. There's a, there's a short summary but then very detailed description of everything you need to know to get that credential. Um, I usually recommend people use that as a checkbox uh, or a checklist uh, for while they learn. Now, we're just the credentialing body. We don't actually do any training or sell books or anything like that. Uh, we rely on third parties and, um, you know, Wiley, Cybex, Pearson uh, Publishing. They all have books. There's a number of training companies that have courseware and uh, a number of online training companies that have uh, video learning, online text with a virtual machine, so you actually get some hands-on experience. Um, there's a number of ways you can actually go about learning these skills. Um, colleges quite often include our uh, uh, objectives, our learning objectives in their curriculum. Uh, so even a community college uh, would have something, a place for you to start learning. But the, one of the important things is to use that checklist on our website to make sure that whatever learning you're doing, even if it's a couple of books or a course and an extra book, that there's no missing pieces. Uh, it's, it's really useful to know how to use the Linux operating system well, uh, no matter what you're doing on it. Right. Okay, any other questions? I don't know if I can. Um, whoever, I think whoever's controlling the slides, if you could bring the slide deck up. I just want to leave um, oh. a little placeholder here at the end. Oh. Okay. Um, so just as we exit here, um, this one's just a very interesting quote from Lifehacker. Um, it's talking about the top 10 uses for Linux. Um, and that's the other good place to start is just start using it, right? You don't necessarily have to replace your entire desktop. You can download uh, virtualization software so you can run extra operating system instances on top of your main computer or on your main computer. And you could just install Linux there. Um, grab someone's laptop in the house that doesn't use it much. Workshop? Oh, yeah. So actually, while you guys are perusing that list, um, w as Medina mentioned, uh, Mad Dog's been coming to campus parties. He's gone to pretty much every one there has been around the world, uh, giving talks a little lengthier than ours. Um, and we've actually been uh, encouraged to consider starting up a workshop at future campus parties to introduce uh, open source technologies to people here. Uh, so we told them we'd ask 
whatever crowd we got, if that would be an interesting set of workshops for us to do at campus parties. So if you think you would actually go to one, uh, can I see a show of hands? Uh, okay. All right, cool. Okay, well, thank you very much, and we'll be available afterwards if you have any questions. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Matt and Medina. Much appreciated. Give them another round of applause, and thank you all.